Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching Behind the Brand. I want to give a special shout out to my friends at Pixability for making this episode possible. And don't forget to subscribe. It actually makes a huge difference to convince the people that don't believe you can watch awesome content like this for free on YouTube. Hope you enjoy the next episode. Thanks for watching. Hey, I'm Jeffrey Hislett and you are watching Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with global business celebrity Jeffrey Hazlett. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, it's good to be here and it's always good to be a global business celebrity. Jeff, tell us how you got this job. You know, uh, by luck, like most things, I just went out and did it. You know, a lot of people are dreamers and they talk about the things they're going to do. I'm one of those people that just goes out and does things. And as I start to do things, I start to gain more momentum. And with more momentum, I'm able to do even more. And I find a way that I sometimes go this way and sometimes I go this way. But the more that I do, the more opportunities are laid in front of me. What are some of the things you're doing? I have my own television show, just much like yours. We're on the C-Suite Network, and that's been very positive. I've had my own primetime show on Bloomberg. I've been a judge on Celebrity Apprentice, so lots of TV. But I've also written, my, this is my third book, third bestseller, Think Big, Act Bigger, The Rewards of Being Relentless, and also Running the Gauntlet and the Mirror Test. And then I do a lot of speaking and a lot of consulting and serve on numerous boards and own a lot of different companies. Talk about the C-Suite a little bit. It's not easy to get into the C-suite, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies? Well, just say Fortune 1000. You know, if you look at Fortune 1000 times five officers in each company, that's only 5,000. There are more people playing professional sports in the United States than are actually in the Fortune 1000 company. So when you look at that, to be, as I was, a former Fortune 100 officer, that's the elite of the elite of the elite. There's only 500 of us in the world. And so when you look at that, it's no. It's not easier. It's actually easier to become a professional athlete than to break into that fortune level of that leadership. But, and I've been very lucky to be able to do that. I'm curious about that. I want to break it down. I know, I know a lot of people watch this show. They're on the path to the C-suite or they are in the C-suite. Um, how do you get that job? I mean, is it, uh, is it your experience? Is it part charisma? Is it a little bit of luck? A little bit of everything, quite frankly. But you, you've got to be good at what you do. I mean, when you're playing at that level, it's at the highest levels there are. I mean, this is high table stakes and a lot of uh, stress and a lot of things are riding on. You, you're basically playing with people's lives and their livelihood. So you better be damn good at what you do when you're in at that level because you don't want to be messing, making huge mistakes. Now, you'll make mistakes, don't get me wrong, and there's a lot of them that have made mistakes and lose their job and, and cause many tens of thousands of people to lose their jobs because they go bankrupt or or problems but you know by and large um, you're really good at what you do you're the best of the best and 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 I'm not saying that because I've been there and and, and with all bravado you know because it's not hubris if it's true you know but the key thing is yeah we do what we do and we've done it well and we've been groomed to some extent now some of us get a little bit luckier in finding that job or position but you don't stay there very long you know and it, as I said it's a high stakes game the average you the life of a CMO, at least when I was doing the job, was 18 months. So you didn't stay in those jobs. It's a dog eat dog kind of business. Maybe look into this camera here and give some of the C-Street or up and coming C-Suite some personal advice? Well, the biggest personal advice I can give you about the C-Suite is to stay focused. You know, what are your conditions of satisfaction? Not only for yourself, and I tell entrepreneurs this, but I especially tell people in the C-Suite, what are the, you know, one to five, maybe six things that you're going to deliver as part of your job? Whether it's increased sales, increased profitability, increased brand awareness, or increased brand value, and then, you know, what are the margins that you're going to be able to do? And then if you're a marketer, then you're also going to be talking about customer satisfaction and then maybe maybe you're also want to do is focus on how well I get around or get along with all the other people in the C-suite because they are your team and you're going to need them as, as part of that journey and if you don't have them it's going to be a long difficult time while you're there so what does it mean to act big and think bigger Jeff well, you know, for so long we've doing nothing but cutting our businesses and finding ways to stop things. And that's really what happens in a lot of companies, especially the bigger companies. But even in small companies, we find ways to put abstract obstacles or, you know, in perceived kinds of uh, obstructions in front of us that we think 
are reasons why we can't do things. And what I want to do is have people be bigger and badder and bolder in what they do and get rid of all those things and, and to go and move to a bigger pond and do the things that they want to do. They've always wanted to do them. We all start out that way, but we've been beaten down. And this is our way of saying, look, we're going to think big and do the things we really want to do, but we're going to act bigger. So what are some of these obstacles that get people stuck? You know, in my book, Think Big, Act Bigger, The Rewards of Being Relentless, I actually have pages and pages of excuses that people have given to me. You know, whether it's my cat had dialysis and I couldn't, you know, come in and do the work, or we shouldn't activate things on Wednesday because Tuesday's the best day, you know, or it's not in the budget, or I love this one, we tried this one before and it didn't work. We'll try it again, you know? And so th that's really what it's about, is to say, to take all those things about in business every single day, it's about making choices. You come in every day, I look at my calendar. My calendar might be the things I need to do that day, but you know what? Other things might creep in or other things might pop up and I gotta change it, get over it. No one's gonna die and make the kinds of choices you have to do every single day to make sure you're thinking big because I think we all have great, great thoughts and we wanna do the right thing, but we don't act bigger. And that's really the key is to overcome those obstacles and make sure you put it in place. Yeah, I, I tend to think that it takes one to know one. You know, like, You've had experience with this, and so you can write about it intelligently. Have you been there? Oh, I, I, every day. Are you kidding me? I, just like everybody, we, we have all these um, things we can't focus on. You know, you have this, I have this. I call them squirrels, and we have to kill the squirrels. Every day, guys like you and me have to kill squirrels. Now, in the movie Up, there was this great scene where there was Doug the talking dog, and he had this collar that was made for him by his master, and he would come up to you and say, hi, I'm Doug the talking dog. My master has outfitted me with this collar. I think you're a very nice person. Squirrel. And they would look away. Well, that's what happens every single day in business. And if we're going to get the things we want accomplished, done, in the time frame, and exceed our expectations, we have to kill squirrels. You know, literally and figuratively. We have to find those things, hunt them down, and kill them. Because that's the things that take away of getting the things done that we need to do. Give us some action items. Tell us, you know, okay. We understand the problem now, how do we fix it? Yeah, one of the biggest things I put in the book was actually my own time triangle. Now, I think that's kind of a thing I wasn't expecting and all of a sudden it showed up in the book because my co-author and the editor said, no, put it in. It was actually my time triangle. And what I do is I have a list of priorities. Those things that are, you know, the biggest things I must do, those things that kind of have to do and some of the things I want to get to. And typically what we do is we put the, you know, the big things at the top and all the way down and make a list of like 100 items. I group them into three different things. But what I do is take a pyramid, you know, a triangle, and I invert it and put the big end at the top, which means those are the things I put in there that I must spend the most of my time. And I put that at the very top of the page and in the top of the time triangle to be able to say, that's where I want to spend my time. That seems like a real simple kind of thing, but most of us don't spend most of our time on the two or three things that are the biggest things for our business. We get you know, diluted by all these little things that are way down the list. And that, that's my way of being able to say, I'm not going to succumb to that kind of pressure or to those kinds of squirrels. I'm going to focus in on the two or three things that are really going to make things happen for me. Yeah, I, mean, I think Stephen Covey used to write a lot about that, you know, first things first and you know, setting priorities. Uh, give me an idea what's at the top of that triangle. So what are some of these activities? Well, for me right now, it's the investment and the things that I have for scale to get to where I want to on my television shows or on the network that we have and the investments that we're making in companies. So those are the ones that have the greatest attention. With that, with the investment side for scale also comes the number of people that watch or listen to my shows. So I'm spending a lot of time on that. And then the third thing is I've always found out, and I used to be partners with a guy named Sheldon Adelson who used to own the, uh, the Vene he owns a Venetian and one of the richest guys in the world. And, and I once asked him about Comdex. I said, what makes a great trade show? And he said, attendees beget exhibitors, exhibitors beget attendees. And if you extrapolate that out, it means great content gets great followers and audience, and great audience you, drives you to do better content. And so I'm really focused in on the content and building that audience. And so who are you building C-Suite for? So you got C-Suite TV. Right. And this show is distributed through C-Suite. Yep. 
Who's it for? So I'm focused in on those 90, I'm focused in on that small one or two percent of the business that's responsible for 95 percent of the total spend in business. So this isn't for the masses, this isn't like Jimmy Fallon or, you know. I would love to have the kind of numbers that Jimmy Fallon has, I'd love to be as talented as Jimmy Fallon, I'm not. But what I am talented at is that the things I do for the C-suite and the advice that I typically give for businesses or bring content to that particular audience. When you look at North America alone, there's 28 million businesses in North America. America. Now, if you sit there and extrapolate them by zeros or dollars that they earn, and every time we hit and add a zero, we change the complexity of the business. So let's go to a million, 10 million, 100 million, and a billion dollars. If you take that 28 million businesses in North America, 20 million of them are less than $1 million. 7.5 of them, million of them are less than $10 million. There are 585,000 businesses that are between 10 million and 100 million, 15,000 businesses between 100 million and a billion, and only 7,500 businesses that are greater than a billion. So you, you roughly 600,000 businesses are over $10 million, yet those 600,000 businesses account for 95% of the spend in North America. So when you look at that, I want to reach the creme de la creme, the very top, the most powerful business network. And if you take that times five officers, roughly, that's three million executives, maybe stretch it up to five million, that's the audience that I'm focused on. That doesn't mean I don't like people to watch me that are small entrepreneurs or small businesses or startups or franchises or whatever, but I really, the money for us is in that 10 million and above and in that C-suite. That's why we call it the C-suite network. That's why we call it the C-suite book club, the C-suite TV, C-suite radio, C-suite academy. We're very focused in on that C-suite. I'm really glad you said that. I really want to underscore what we're saying here because I think a lot of people get hung up on the fact that, oh, well, you don't have a viewership of 50 million or whatever it is. And so I really want to underscore the importance of these narrow, deep niches, right? It's not about the number of people that are watching. It's about the right people. The right people and having the right message to the right people. I mean, and the click. I always tell advertisers when I talk to them, you don't need a million clicks. You just need one click. Because when someone watches one of our shows and we do an interview with a company, say, like Smart Technologies, which makes this big, huge, white smart board that they've been selling to schools, now selling into the businesses, and someone sees it and places an order for 100,000 units, that's a $50 million order. That's a great use of their content, great use of their time, and a great you know, exposure on a limited number of people that are watching. But yet, even into the millions, we still get into the millions on some shows, not on every show. And digitally is where we go, because the, when was the last time you rushed out to watch a primetime television show? You, never. Well, never. You don't do it. Better, yeah. yeah. And then, but when was the last time you rushed out to watch a primetime business show? <laughs> Not going to happen. So what we have to do is deliver the content to the people that when they need it and how they want to receive it. And so that becomes into that mobile, into that desktop, or into that, you know, to that iPad or, or a personal device. And so that's where we're focusing on. That's where TV is going to go, as is most content. The most personal device there is in the world now is your cell phone. You know where your cell phone is more than you know where your children are. Yeah, I mean, Tim Cook just announced at the Apple, you know, last developer conference, the future of TV is apps. It's about... As that, always. <laughs> yeah, and it is about that uh, very selective, very personal, personalized audience, right? Which is why, and, and that's a great point, Brian, because you're bringing out that selective audience, and this is why building your tribe that people have talked about. I've always said that the bigger your personal community is, the bigger your personal broadcast network is. And so when you start to look at that your followers, your network of people, so in the C-suite network we have a million and a half executives that are actively involved, that becomes a very prized community. You know, a very elite, powerful group of business executives, uh, men and women who we can sell to, educate, communicate with, engage with, and then get feedback in order to be able to be a better service to them. And that's really what we're trying to do. I want to go back to think big, act bigger. Um, I think I love the concept. You know, I, I, I think I'm there. I'm trying to do that. But 
What do you say to me if I try and it doesn't work out? It, it will work out. Nothing works out the very first time you tried. Think about the first time you ever tried cooking or you, you, you tried kissing a girl. It just didn't work out very well. It wasn't good. It was magical, but not good. And so what you have to do is you have to hold to those, those, that thinking that I am going to get better. Just like when we first started walking, just like when we first started running, just like when we first started driving, everything took practice. And to think big, you know, is a kind of a natural thing, but to act bigger takes a lot of practice. You know what? It's called hard work because it's freaking hard. And that's what we have to keep in mind. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And it's not easy. It takes pers perseverance. It takes being relentless every freaking day because there are people inside the organization and people inside your head that want to stop you every single day from acting bigger. And it's only the relentless that win in the end. It's never the lucky, maybe a couple lucky people who win the lottery and win the lottery in business. But by and large, it's the relentless who always win. How do you know when to pivot? I mean, I understand you can't beat someone who never quits, right? You can only uh, lose if you quit. But there has to come a time where you know, you're bleeding money or it's just not working out and you, you have to make a change. I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's always around conditions of satisfaction and you've really got to put these in place for yourself, your business. You know, how much money am I willing to invest before I say enough's enough? How much pain am I willing to go through before I say enough's enough? You know, I'll never be a marathon runner. I'll never be a sprinter. I'll never be a beauty contestant winner. You know, it has to be realistic. So setting down and setting reasonable expectations about what you want and when you want them and when you want them to occur, that's an important thing to do. Now you adjust them as you go along the way, but as long as you're in the ballpark of saying, look, I'm only gonna put this much of my savings in, or I'm only gonna put this much of my time in, or I'm only gonna use up this much personal collateral as part of the activity, you've really gotta set those limits and then know what those are. Now some of us are really good at it, meaning we've done it a lot. I've bought and sold over 250 businesses is my career. I know what it will take. I kind of get the sense of what, you know, how fast I need to move on a business, you know, when it's going sour on me real quick and I need to bail out. But, but it takes a lot of experience with that. So until you have that experience, make sure you set good conditions of satisfaction. And when I talk about that, those are promises. And I'm not talking about, you know, a goal or something. I'm talking about pinky promises. Th something like you set with your kids, where if you break them, somebody says you're breaking a promise. That's real critical. Talk to me about the metrics. So how should I be measuring my success? I know it's not just win or lose, right? There's a lot of other little metrics I should be Well, for, Yeah, for everyone, your own metrics are your own. But for me, let me give you what mine are. Mine are very simple. I want to, first of all, build wealth for me and my family. I mean, I gotta make money. Now, do I wanna make a lot? Sure, but I'm also you know, living in South Dakota. I don't need a lot of money. I need enough to make sure that they're feeding the cows and feeding the horses and so forth. But I do keep track of the money because that's how we keep score. So building wealth for my family, very critical. My second condition of satisfaction for me personally is I want to learn something. I wanna do things that are interesting so that it keeps my attention because I have the attention span of a gnat. So it's very important for me to want to continue to learn. Continuous improvement is a good portion of that. And then the third thing for me is it's gotta be fun. You know, and I gotta have fun at what I'm doing. If I'm every day waking up and I just don't wanna go through it, I don't wanna go into the office, I don't wanna do things, then I'm not really doing the things I wanna do. And for me, it's gotta meet all three of those. I can get by with two of them for a while, until I bring up the third one, whichever one of those it is, maybe it's profitability because that seems to be the one, at least for me all the time, that takes a longer time for it to be able to get to because I'm putting money in rather than getting money out, especially to be realistic about a startup or a new, a new kind of company. But if it doesn't catch up, I have to bail out. I have to get out. So it's real important for you to have those conditions of satisfaction. Where do you think the industry is heading? You're in broadcast, you're on camera, um, you're a global celebrity. Where's all this though, new media heading? We're now sort of, you know, maturing with Facebook and Instagram is, is in kind of full gear. Snapchat's picking up speed. Everyone's talking about video. I mean, we could be periscoping or scoping this or Facebook Live. Where are we headed? Well, I think it's always going to be visual. I think we're a very visual kind of animal. So I think visual is a very important thing. Although at the same time, you're seeing podcasts with a great big resurgence. And I, I think people like to do that because you can't watch sometimes, but you can listen. 
And But by and large, I think video is going to be bigger and bigger. And it's going to be like nothing we've seen before. It'll continue to be the big screen, which I mean by that television. For a long time, television is going to be there until that population dies off. But television the way that we've known it in the past won't be what we see in the future. It'll be much more digital, much more focused, and much more slim. And to end up being slim, I mean lots smaller audiences and many, 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 many different channels and many different options. So getting engagement, getting to know your customer, getting to know the viewer, and making sure you have that connection is paramount. And being good to their friends, because friend sourcing is the biggest thing that happens for you when it comes to this kind of television. You know, people find out about great shows around the water cooler. Well, the new water cooler is Facebook, the new water cooler is Snapchat, the new water cooler is all those social media tools that we have. So to be connected with and engaged with that viewer is very important for you to be able to gain the kind of viewership that you need, you know, uh, for the advertisers and sponsors that are going to help you pay for it. Because I don't care what anyone says, in the end, that's how I want to be measured and most people are measuring you on that kind of wealth. So with all this happening in new media, with all this content that's being created, and you know, you, you're seasoned, you're experienced, you've got you know, a lot of business experience under your belt. Is now the best time or the worst time to start something? It's always a good time to start something. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. So you should be starting something new now. Now, is the timing perfect? Could it be better? Yeah, maybe, but again, Dreamers dream, doers do. And if you do, you'll start catching your dreams up to the things that you're doing. And I think that's the most important thing that most people have to keep in mind. You know, most dreamers never get shit done. So they never get it done and doers do. And it might, could it be perfect? Can I wait for it to be perfect? Yeah. So the time is to start now. Even in the worst of times, in 2008, there were companies that were making a lot of money. And there were companies that were growing double digit, triple digits, or even larger during the biggest downturn. If you have a great product, a great service that people want to have, you can be very successful at it. So the time to do it is now. I, let's ask you personally. Like, so because you've been there, done that, you've got all this, is it easier for you personally or is it harder for you now to start something new or learn something? It's, it's, um, it's really easy for me to start anything new because I like doing that. My biggest problem is to pick which new thing I need to do because I have a thousand ideas going through my head and I have to sort through those and say which ones are the real winners. Sometimes I don't know. So I'm one of those kinds of guys where I'll play around with different things and throw it up and cook it like spaghetti and throw it on the wall to see what sticks in order to find the things that, that work well. Or I might make investments in companies to look at those kinds of things. So for me, the biggest hard, hardest thing for me is to keep the focus in on the things that are going to be the best use of my time. Because I'm always, like a lot of people out there, looking for a pony out there in everything that I'm looking at. I want to get a little bit um, personal now too. I want to dive a little bit deeper into the emotional part of this journey. I mean, the struggle is real, right? We're all in it in some degree or the other. Talk about you know, some of those emotional hurdles. Talk about you know, when the peanut gallery or even your own family is saying, you know, Jeff, I don't know, man, this just ain't working. Yeah, well, it's tough. It's always tough. And if you think it's easy, it's not. It never is. And if, even if you think the most seasoned of us are can put up with it, it's, it gets to you at some point. I mean, it always does, without question. Have you ever felt depressed or discouraged? Oh, or constantly. I mean, you constantly. I mean, I just like, you know, make, getting on television, I gotta go to the bathroom five times before I get on camera. You know, it, it, I'm human. We're all human. So the, all those emotions are there. You learn to deal with them or understand or see certain things. You know, the criticism that you get from the peanut gallery that you might mention, that doesn't bother me. I don't care about those because those people aren't gonna be sitting around my bed when I'm dying or carrying my casket at the funeral. So I could care less what those people say. Do you read comments like, you know, whether it's your well, blog I, or... Yeah, I see them all the time. I, fine. And, but, you know, most of the time, as you well know, Brian, I'm, I'm well known for telling the guy to go to hell or, you know, go F yourself. I, I don't have a problem doing that because I don't, you can't be rude. And, and I, I'm, I'm one of those people who have certain kinds of standards around how you should treat people. And I confront bad behavior. I do not like bad behavior. Just like I would confront someone I think is being a bigot or someone who's mistreating someone or, you know, hurting someone 
that's, that's less of them, meaning smaller of stature. I don't like those kinds of things. And so therefore, I rush to those people aid and I confront those things wherever possible. Now I'm of that size where I'm, I can do that, but I'm also of that size mentally where I'm okay with that. And so that's why I'm saying those things don't bother me. You're gonna have haters all the time. And if you're gonna be a thought leader, if you're gonna be someone who's out there, and, and, I, and I mean this by a leader in your business, you're gonna take heat. That's part, of the, that's, part of the, that's part of the goal or part of the, the responsibility when you're the head quarterback at a, at a winning team. People aren't going to like you. That's okay. That's, you got to be comfortable in your own skin to be able to do that. I, but the key thing for, I think, most people, and I have to do this for myself, is have some great people around me who ground me and have good practices that ground me. And if, if you don't have those kinds of things, then it can kind of get wacko. And, you, and we watch people in this business, the TV business or in the business business, where they start believing their own press releases. And, and, and I talk about this in my book, about having a servant mentality, of having a bigger purpose and making sure that you know what the things you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be doing and don't lose, you know, don't let, don't let the connection or lose the connection that you have with getting dirty sometimes. It's a very important thing. Let's talk to maybe the younger audience a little bit, people who are the up and coming, the future generation. What advice would you give them, whether they're entrepreneurs or have a startup or they're working for the man right now and, you know, plotting in their garage, you know, to, to escape? What advice would you give them? Yeah, first of all, the biggest, biggest advice I can give to most people who are plotting and, you know, planning their next big move is there's no shortcuts. You know, it, I said it earlier that it's hard work because it's hard and it's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it, be doing it. So you're going to have to do the things. There's always a step of crawl, a step of walk and a step of run. Now you can move through those steps faster, but you're going to have to do all three steps. You can't move all the way to having a baby. You got to have nine months of pregnancy in order to deliver that baby. You can't get nine women pregnant each one month and then have a baby much sooner. You have to go through the steps. And that's the key thing that you're gonna to have to learn about starting a business and running a business is you're gonna to have to cover all the bases and do all the steps and it's hard work. All right, we've been spending a little time with Jeffrey Hazlett. Uh, check out his new book. Check out the C-Suite TV and C-Suite conferences plus a thousand other things that he's doing. Jeff, thanks for being on the show. And keep thinking big.